the title of the session is PHP Reinvented. And uh, this won't be like an introduction to just using Composer, but rather I want to shine a light on the uh, developments outside of PHP that have influenced recent changes within PHP, which have then also influenced development in Drupal, which is what probably all of you are most interested in. Turn on. I think it's working fine. Yeah, maybe just move it a little closer, Mom. Are you good? Yeah. All right. Um, so I'll just start with a little bit uh, about what I do and why I'm even like qualified to talk to you about this to begin with. Um, I do work in a lot of different free software, uh, most of which you can find on GitHub. Um, I lead the development of PHPD, which, much like Drupal, is one of these really old PHP projects that's been around for a really long time uh, by internet standards, at least. Um, I co-authored Composer, the package manager for PHP, um, which I'll get into later. Um, and I work for Forumatic, which is the PHP hosting platform. Um, and we also do consulting around PHP and Composer. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of a philosophical um, thing here. Um, just to uh, ma make you understand why all of the stuff that I'm going to introduce you to later uh, should even matter to you. Um, and I came across this article a while ago, it was like a New York Times blog, I've got the link somewhere later. Um, and it had this really interesting study, um, where it, it was covering an interesting study by two guys called the Dunning and Kruger. Um, something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which a few of you might have heard of before. Um, and, and while they were researching this, uh, these kind of tricks that you know, our mind can play on ourselves, they came across a story. Um, that played out in Boston in the mid-90s, where um, a bank robber uh, robbed two banks in a single day, and uh, two detectives started to investigate this. And obviously one of the first things you do if somebody robs a bank, you look at the video footage, right? I mean, it's like the most obvious thing you do. And right there on the video footage, you see the guy without any kind of mask, standing there asking the teller for the money, and you can clearly identify who this person is. Um, so they were already confused, you know, why would somebody do that? Like, that seems like a very stupid move if you're a bank robber, you know, just walk in there without anything whatsoever, uh, masking <coughs> uh, Anyway, they sent out these photos in the community nearby, and sure enough, this person actually lived nearby, and they found him the next day and arrested him. It's like the easiest case hauled ever. Um, so, as they were interrogating him, they asked him, how come that you, know, you didn't wear a mask? Like, what, why, what did you expect to happen? And he was really confused that he was visible on any video footage at all. After all, he had been wearing the lemon juice. Yeah. The lemon juice? Like, so these two detectives were really just very confused by what this guy was saying. And it turns out that a friend of him who was his accomplice in this bank robbery, who mostly stood outside, figured a few things out beforehand and took some part of the money later, convinced him that if he were to pour lemon juice all over his face, he would not be visible on cameras. And this guy didn't just believe that, right? Like, he obviously wanted to test this out, so he actually took a photo of himself using a Polaroid camera. And he showed these photos to the detectives later on, and he's not visible on and so there's like a few possibilities here. Either he also was not clever enough to use the camera correctly and pointed it away from himself. Uh, maybe he just, you know, missed himself. Maybe the film was bad. They never quite figured that part out. But what all this leads to is, um, this is just like a funny story, but you'll find a lot more of these, um, to the idea of what makes you qualified to, to act on something you want to do. Uh, so this guy clearly was not qualified to rob a bank. Right? And he, but the worst thing that would have made him realize that he was not qualified to rob a bank, namely him realizing that you could not put lemon juice in your face to become invisible, um, if he had known that, he would have realized he wasn't qualified to rob the bank and he wouldn't have done it. So there was no way for him to realize that he was unqualified to rob the bank, without also finding out about the information that made him unqualified to rub the back. So um, they, they came up with a more general phrasing of uh, what this uh, general principle is. Uh, when people are incompetent in the strategies they adopt to achieve success and satisfaction, they suffer a dual burden. Uh, 
Not only do they reach erroneous conclusions and make unfortunate choices, but their incompetence robs them of the ability to realize it. Instead, like Mr. Wheeler, this is the robber I was just talking about, they are left with the erroneous impression they are doing just fine. This is an issue you really come across everywhere, in industry and politics, right? People will not realize that they are unqualified to do something unless they have the very knowledge that would make them qualified to do so. So they, they are, it is impossible for them to realize uh, that maybe the thing that they think are they're really good at is not something they're good at without becoming good at it. All right, so anyway, my, the point I'm trying to make here is um, even if you think that you're an expert in your particular field, if you're, you're an expert at working on a Drupal site, you're an expert on working with PHP, uh, how are you going to know that there isn't stuff that you're missing? Right? And I guess in that sense, uh, congratulations to all of you. You're here, so clearly you're trying to find out more. Uh, you know, you, you made the assumption that maybe there are things that you haven't heard about yet that you need to learn about. And so even if, uh, from your own perspective, you believe that you are the expert in your field, that you are, um, that you've heard all there is, the only way to find out is by continuously trying to uh, learn about technology, about issues outside of the particular area that you're in, and trying to find out about things that you haven't heard of yet. All right, anyway, so far for the philosophy part. Um, and let's get into more like technology stuff, because one thing I do want to start with, and this is something people will, I don't know, shake their heads at maybe, um, is this whole cloud thing, right? It's a, it's a buzzword, and people use that all the time, everywhere, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but the question you can ask yourself when you hear one of these buzzwords is, isn't there maybe a reason it became a buzzword? You know, isn't there something to it that might be worth researching? Uh, isn't there some broader development going on that led to it being a buzzword? And let's look at the uh, at, at what stands behind that and what turned into a buzzword, and let's see if there's not something of worth to us uh, in there, even though people use it in a lot of places. It really has nothing to do with. Um, there's a another word. Uh, that I find really interesting in the context of cloud computing. So to me, cloud computing is mostly uh, hosting, but there's a lot of automation involved, right? It's like the same thing that you've done for the last couple of decades. There's really not a whole lot different to it. It's just uh, now it's you know it's a little faster. There's some automation involved. You can get the servers quickly. You can set them up rather quickly. Um, and a, a word that comes up in this context is ephemerialization. I only learned about this a couple days ago. Um, it's something that people at Heroku, one of these PHP um, platform as a service uh, solutions, um, likes to use to describe what they're trying to do. Um, if you continuously try to simplify the technology that we use um, to offer more and more opportunity to innovate and build technology with it, uh, making it continuously simpler to get started on project at the same time, allowing for more and more flexibility in what you build. That's kind of what you can think of here. Is you try to take the the parts that are repetitive, that appear that you have to go do and over and over again, um, and you try to simplify these, automate them, and you focus on what actually creates value. So this whole automation thing, there's like a couple of tools that are really interesting. And um, these are things like Puppet, Chef, Solve, Ansible. Um, they help you manage servers. And this came up with the whole idea of cloud movement. So you're running this large web service that runs across hundreds and thousands of servers. You need to figure out some way of managing these. So that's how people started to look at automating the system administration tasks involved in this. So that uh, you have a couple thousand machines, one of these is thrown out for a couple of weeks, it comes back on, it's going to come into the same state as the rest of the servers, it's got to have the same software installed in it. Now that's an issue that I guess a lot of you probably won't ever run into because you run a web service of thousands of servers. I mean, there's a couple of really big companies that do that, uh, and most others are probably running on like individual servers on like very small sets of servers. 
Uh, but there's value in these tools for them anyway. Because the thing that they have changed is that rather than having a manual process for configuring the environment within your software runs, there is now a very well-defined process for how you go from nothing's installed on the machine to exactly what we need in order to run our software is installed on the machine. Now their thinking was you have to do this thousands of times and everywhere, uh, but that's very valuable even if you're doing this on a single server. Because let's say, I don't know, you're, you have some hardware code and you just set this up somewhere else, dealing with backups is always kind of difficult, it's very useful if you have a very precise uh, computer machine understandable description of the exact steps that were necessary to install the operating system, all of the, the web server, the database on there, all the different packages that you find on a server. Um, it's also extremely useful for development environments. So if you have an exact description in machine readable format of uh, what all of your servers look like, what versions of which software is installed in there, that's extremely helpful if you're a new developer in a team and you want to get the software running. Um, you don't have to go through some long readme, some documentation that somebody put up on the internal company wiki somewhere a couple of years ago and that's kind of outdated uh, to install all the different the right versions of like, the different software that all of this thing depends on. And after a couple of days of doing this, you eventually end up with a developer machine that you can now start participating. But instead, you can make use of tools like Vagrant which allow you to run these tools on a small virtual machine within your, uh, on your laptop, on your desktop computer, uh, to get set up with a development environment that matches as closely as possible the environment that you will have on your actual live server, for servers, um, will get you started working on there very quickly. So the introduction of these tools that came about with the idea of the cloud, of having lots of servers to manage, of automating them, um, actually changed things uh, on the low scale as well. And uh, the main change that you can see here is that you go away from the idea of installing one thing after another to uh, one finite description of the entire set of all the dependencies of your software. Um, you have a, a description that will go from you have nothing installed on the machine to everything we need uh, in just a couple lines of code. Uh, you have a description that goes from, hey, we've turned this machine off a couple months ago, but you get it to the point uh, the other machines are on, and you can set, use the same set of rules. <laughs> Um, so this uh, general, you know, keep that in mind, uh, because this is something that relates very strongly to what, how Composer was designed. Now Composer is also a package manager, I mentioned that before, and the package managers, dependency management software is something that exists in a lot of places. Um, the most familiar might be the various Linux package managers uh, that you use to install software and servers. Uh, there's sort of RPM, apt, and Debian. There's Portage, there's Yum, a zipper radio version of uh, Yum. Um, and these are things that you know usually a system administrator would use to install the various software necessary to run a web application. Um, but the same thing exists, um, not quite as long, in various language environments, where rather than installing system-wide dependencies for software you want to run, you install project-specific dependencies for a piece of software that you're building. So you have this in Java with Maven. Um, or some of the other JVM languages like Scala, or Clojure, Lightning, and SBT. Um, thing, thing, same thing exists in Ruby, or in Python, or in JavaScript. Um, NPM is something that's been uh, getting a lot of traction recently. Um, it's the way that uh, JavaScript and the server people have installed all the dependencies of their projects. But PHP, there's, well, they used to be not really a decent solution to this. Uh, the very standard practice of how you'd go about using a third-party library in a PHP project is copy and pasting the file into your project. Um, you'd either uh, include a lot of their files to get started, uh, maybe they'd supply you with an auto-loading mechanism that you'd set up to use that library. Um, there were some people use it, or a lot of people, I think this is maybe like three years ago, uh, were using Subversion at that time. So SVN externals was a very popular option for using third-party libraries that were also using Subversion. Um, there was Pear, 
actually curious here, who here has used pair before? Sorry. Uh, who here has used pair to install PHP unit? All right, that's kind of interesting. Um, so the thing with pair that never really took off is that you can actually install any third party software through pair. It's actually, it is actually a package manager in the sense that the other ones are. However, in the PHP world, it ended up being mostly restricted to the pair library that was in pair.php.net. There's a very limited set of uh, available components there that are managed by one particular group, also called the pair group. And this confusion between this particular set of libraries, the group of people maintaining this particular set of libraries, and the pair installer, which would actually have been perfectly fine with installing something from other sources, uh, that would be not particularly popular um, for anyone to install their software. Uh, so you would use this in order to install some of these pair libraries, but hardly anybody ever decided to use pair to install some other software that was not related to pair at all. Um, so, like I said, so this is maybe 2010. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, I work in PHPVB. And PHPV has this really long tradition of something called mods. It's a really terrible idea that stuck along for a really long time. Uh, where rather than provide plugins in the form of you know, self-contained pieces of code that plug into the functionality of PHPV, you provide patches to apply to PHP source code. So all PHP plugins, if you want to call them that, are actually patches to the source code. And you can imagine the result if you try and update a PHP installation patched by the various plugins somebody installed, right? Plugins, because they're really not that much of a plugin. Um, which resulted in people hardly ever updating their PHP installations. Uh, I've gotten better at this over time. There's updaters that uh, actually patch your code to the newest version that deal with concepts <laughs> automatically. It's pretty impressive software, really. Uh, it's just it's solving a problem that really shouldn't be solved to begin with, right? Because uh, that really just means that it was a very poor uh, design initially that didn't allow people to extend the functionality of PHP. All right, either way, so we're stuck with that, and we decided we need to change something about that. But the, the only way to actually accomplish that would be to uh, make some major architectural changes to PHP v itself. Uh, because PHP, the reason people were doing this is that PHP was not easily extendable. So one of the ideas that we were playing around with at the time was maybe using one of these PHP frameworks out there. Um, and there were some really interesting developments going on at the time. Um, so for example, Symfony 2 uh, was just starting to be worked on in the beginning of 2010. Um, and we kind of look at what they were doing there and thought this is really interesting to us, maybe we should base our software on that. And we sort of made the decision already, but um, the, the first thing we had to solve to be sure that we could continue at that path was we had to come up with an actual plugin system that was going to work for the future. So we started to work on this, uh, I mean, like actually work on this in early 2011 and uh, tried to come up with some concept of how we want to go about this. And as we were doing that, we were looking at all the stuff that I just told you about, all these tools that come up, looking at all of these other package managers and how they were doing things. Because that's really the way that you write the best software, not by you know, thinking really hard for yourself and then maybe coming up with an idea and writing that down, but instead, a look at what other people have created, see what issues they ran into, what things that they do incorrectly, what did they do right, and then repeat the right parts and you want the incorrect ones, right? It's really easy. Um, so, I mean, in a sense, you could call this like, this like stealing ideas, but that's the very idea behind all of this is that you share these ideas and that uh, you reuse what makes sense, and uh, through that, you will get to uh, much better quality software. All right, so we started to look at all of this, and we were also starting to talk to the Symphony community because we were looking at using their framework, right? And it, it turned out that they actually had a very similar problem because they had come up with this concept of Symphony bundles, uh, which is how they bundle individual pieces of functionality in their framework uh, so that you can use them within different projects. Uh, and they also needed some system to uh, install these to ensure that their dependencies are met, that the right 
versions of dependencies of libraries necessary for them uh, were installed. And it turns out this is very much the same issue. So rather than uh, working on a PHP plugin system or a Symfony bundle system or some system that would have worked for PHPB and Symfony because they're both based on Symfony, uh, we decided to actually try and come up with a solution that would solve this problem in general for any PHP developer. So that's even somebody who does not use PHP at all or Symfony can benefit from this new tool that we're about to create. Uh, that's what we ended up calling Composer. Um, so Composer is mainly a, a dependency manager. And I use the word dependency manager as opposed to package manager to describe this very idea that I introduced earlier with the tools like Puppet or Chef, um, that rather than um, installing a package, you describe the set of packages necessary for your software to run. So you don't uh, tell Composer to uh, install this HTTP library today, and then tomorrow you decide, oh, we also need uh, something to, I don't know, read a JSON file, so we're going to install that today. But instead, you keep track of a set of all the things that are necessary for your piece of software to run, so that you can easily pass this on to a new developer, so that you can easily uh, move this to your server and install all the same dependencies there. Uh, Composer is made up of, um, or the Composer ecosystem is made up of a number of different tools. Uh, there is Composer itself, which is really just a CLI tool. Um, the goals there were make it easy to use, because uh, people who have tried Pair before often ran into issues with that. Uh, we want to install dependencies per project, as I just described, rather than, as Pair did, try to install them system-wide so that all projects that you're working on, for example, have to use the same versions of the dependencies that you have. Um, and the whole thing was supposed to be sort of flexible and embeddable because, after all, we were still trying to build our PHP plugin system. And we didn't want a PHP plugin uh, system to be a command line tool, right? We want our end users to be able to just like, click on some plugin in a web interface and install that thing. Um, so, Composer is, while it is a CLI tool, it's for the most part a library that allows you to handle these dependencies uh, with a very thin wrapper on top that provides the command line tool that most people use. There's packages. Um, this is the central archive of packages. And unlike here, this is not controlled in any way. So anybody is free to submit any software, any library that they've written onto there. Uh, there's a number of rules of what, how you do that. So for example, the packages, uh, like the names for your packages are namespaced with the vendor name so that you can uniquely identify um, packages and you can't just pretend to be somebody else. Uh, but in general, it's open to any open source software. Uh, and it's a whole lot easier to use than going through the approval process on here, so that we've actually had a lot of people submit their third-party packages. It's also very easy to use because you don't have to publish uh, packaged up builds. You don't have to upload a you know a zip file that you build from your project. Uh, instead, you simply tell where your Git repository, your SVN repository lies, and it will figure this out by itself. Um, and there's Salus. Um, so if you are, uh, so like I said, packages is for all these open source projects. It's the central thing. You just go to packages.org and you find all of these packages. Uh, of course, there is your private code that you want to use within your company that you don't want to share with other people. So you can set up a repository very much like packages uh, for yourself locally, and that's what Salus is. Um, so that you can actually um, sh easily share uh, libraries, maybe Drupal modules. Uh, within uh, your company between different projects using Composer. Uh, there's something called Composer Installers, and this is pretty interesting. Uh, it allows you to manage uh, plugins, modules, extensions, whatever the respective system, call them uh, using Composer. Uh, so there's actually uh, rules for all of the projects I've mentioned here. Um, that explain how to install the respective project's uh, plugins correctly. Uh, this, this is not an extensive list, there's more of them. Uh, it's just how many put on a slide. Um, so Composer is, in that sense, very generalistic. Like It doesn't, it doesn't force you to uh, conform to a particular standard of how you want to install your software. 
but it allows you to define that yourself so that you can use Composer in a lot of different contexts. All right, so I'm gonna uh, show you how people actually use uh, Composer in a regular basis. Uh, it's like the command line tool. Uh, you check out some project, you download the installer. It's a little funny because there's like this curl something line here, which you can copy and paste from our download page. It's really just a workaround for some PHP bugs related to FAR files. Uh, Composer is usually shipped as a FAR file. It's very much like um, a jar, which you might know from the Java world, where you package up a, an entire directory of files into a single file, and you can then ship the, uh, ship the simple file. You don't have to unpack it, you can just use it as is. Uh, so usually Compose is just one file that you can download. Um, however, some PHP configurations have issues with running those files, and in order to check for those settings first, we recommend that people just copy and paste this line into the command line. However, there are at this point integrations into PHP IDEs, uh, there are into, like there are some, uh, I think, uh, visual frontends for using Composer on Windows. Um, this does work on Windows, by the way. Like even though it's a command line, people can actually run this successfully on Windows too. Um, and what it ends up doing, you run something like Composer install, and it installs all the packages that you asked for. Right, so it just like goes through them step by step. In this case, I installed a Twig, which you heard about yesterday, I think, uh, and uh, the Symfony framework in this case too. Uh, what, then, what ends up happening by default is that simply it downloads all of these files into a vendor directory. And this is what these custom installers that I mentioned earlier can, def uh, can change. Like you can define yourself or exactly you need something to be placed in order for it to work with the system that you are working within. Uh, this is how you define the set of dependencies that you have. Um, you create a composer JSON file and within it you simply list the names of the packages that you uh, need for your project to work and the respective versions that will be compatible with your package. Um, so usually you can find these things on packages just by using a search in there. So uh, Silex, for example, is this neat little framework uh, built on top of something. Um, if you search for Silex and packages, you'll find a list of the versions and dependencies. Uh, you can simply say, you know, I'd like to have Silex of this version. You write Composer install, and there it is, ready to use. Um, I'll skip over this, but um, one interesting, like I said, uh, there's a uh, the idea is that you can uh, define these things once, and you don't have to continuously. Uh, you know, install things one after another. And one of the main reasons for that is that if you work in a team, uh, one person might install a different version of some piece of software than another person just because they did it a couple weeks later and there was a new release in between. And then you end up finding running into some bug and the reason for that bug is actually the difference in versions. And these kinds of things are really hard to track down. Uh, so Composer also creates something called a Composer log file. It's automatically created whenever you run Composer install for the first time and you can update it using Composer Update. And it contains a precise list of the actual versions of uh, packages that were installed um, at the particular time. So even if you say, I want just a, a one point any version because that's compatible with my software project. Um, if you run install and install 1.2, it'll mark this in the log file. So if another developer on your team will have run Composer install 2, you will get 1.2, even if 1.3 was released in the meantime, just to make sure that everybody works on the same version. And you can then explicitly run Composer update to make sure that everybody now has the new version. Uh, same thing applies if you run this on servers, so that you make sure that the, dependent, the versions of dependencies that you yourself have tested this on your development machine with are actually the same versions that you're running this on your server with. Uh, all of this is in order to avoid bugs resulting from small differences in uh, the versions of libraries that you're using. And this is very much, again, the same concept that you have with tools like uh, Puppet or Chef that I brought up earlier, um, in that you uh, want to specify as precisely as possible the environment within which your software works. I uh, brought up auto-loading before, so auto-loading is uh, one of these cool things that PHP came up with after a while because using third-party libraries was really hard in PHP um, so that you wouldn't have to manually include all of the files of the library that you would like to use. Uh, 
Um, but instead, they would provide an auto loader that would dynamically load the necessary files for whichever classes you make use of in your code. Uh, and Composer has built in support for that, so yet you don't have to figure out how the particularities that you're trying to use uh, sets up its auto loader, but instead you run this Composer install and it has configured the entire auto loader for you. Um, so you can define, there's a few standards that define auto loaders. PureSort 0 is one of the most common ones that simply maps class names to directory names or namespaces to directory names. Um, but you can also just uh, define a class map that will scan your directory for files containing class definitions and it will generate one out of that. Um, it puts this file in vendor auto loader PHP. And after that, you can simply always require this one file. This is the only require statement any PHP software needs that runs on Composer. And you can just use any software that was installed as a dependency and it will get automatically loaded correctly. Right. Um, so, uh, so this is all triggered uh, an evolution of PHP because now it's suddenly possible uh, to easily use third party libraries. You could actually build a project that used something like 50 different libraries and it would not be an additional burden on the person trying to install the software because it was all just a single call to Composer install. So you no longer had to consider the complexity of installing these libraries uh, when adding them. So suddenly it became possible to actually construct software out of lots of different individual smaller modules um, without creating a huge burden on developers trying to use the software in the end. So people started working on new kinds of libraries that had a goal of very, very simple, very single purpose APIs that would, like libraries that would solve only one particular issue, have a very understandable and very uh, immediately comprehensible API. To a very high code quality, because after all, it's just like a very small piece of code, so it's very easy to test thoroughly. Um, and then we want the code that we have to be very modular, reusable, so that we can combine all of these things easily to build bigger and better things. Some of the methods employed to reach this um, are separation concerns. And these are, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail on these, but these are some of these things that you might want to look into more uh, to improve the kind of software that you write. Separation of concerns. Uh, this is sort of embedded in the idea of having single purpose libraries. Uh, rather than building monolithic frameworks that solve all kinds of problems, everything tied in together with each other so that you can't take one piece, use it somewhere else. Instead, you try to figure out what are the individual <coughs> concerns that this code is dealing with and you try to separate them from each other. And one means of doing that is dependency injection. So that if you have a small library that uh, works on, I don't know, let's say the whole, uh, what is I was talking about, HTTP library earlier. So we have, an H we have a library originally that downloads some JSON files over HTTP and then parses them and returns you the values. So in this new world, we instead have an HTTP library that has some mechanism of uh, injecting a dependency uh, for a response parser. And you have a different library that parses JSON files. And you can simply put an instance of the JSON parser into the HTTP library. So you now have two different libraries. If you're trying to do something with XML, you just throw away the JSON part and use the XML part and stick it in there. So you try to separate all of these different parts from each other uh, and make it so that you can use them with each other. Another mechanism of doing that is events. So for example, let's say you want to have some logging library that logs all kinds of events, then uh, before you would have to actually make calls to some kind of logging library everywhere all over your code. Um, now that means that suddenly all of your software has a dependency on this logging library. So the first step of that is throwing events in all of these places and just having a logger, logging library that receives these events, logs something away. And then you can use this one logging library, you can use a different logging library, you can not use one if you want at all. And the only dependency that you then actually add everywhere is an event dispatcher. And this is usually a very small uh, library to use. So the Symphony Event Dispatcher, for example, is one that is very commonly used. It's also something that's included in Drupal 8. Um, and all of this is developed with either even developed in a test-driven manner, or at least with testability in mind. Um, and an interesting effect is that if you develop software so that it's easily testable as individual units, it often ends up meeting these other criteria um, just because you're trying to do that. Um, 
you try and make software so that it's easy test, easily testable, that means it can't have too many too complex dependencies because those will be difficult to set up in the test. So if you uh, focus on having uh, easily understandable tests, you actually end up writing software, uh, software that follows these other ideas. So resulting from these goals and methods uh, are a set of new PHP frameworks. There's a Symfony 2, there's Laravel, Silex that I mentioned earlier, there's Lithium. Um, there's a lot of new libraries. Um, Aesthetic is a library to deal with static assets uh, in PHP projects. Guzzle is a HTTP library. Monolog is a logging library. Uh, Twig is the template engine. And all these can be just you know, used together in any combination. You can use alternatives. You don't have, you're not tied to a set of all of these together that are within one uh, universe. You, you're not tied to using uh, you know, only the Drupal libraries, because only the things that are compatible with Drupal, you, know, you can use in a Drupal project. But you can use any of these and combine them with each other. And the result of this is a fast innovation cycle because uh, you can more easily get started in something new now, right? Because you can just use, you can more easily pick from the set of existing libraries so that you can focus on the things that you yourself actually want to build. Um, so just to uh, point out how much that, or how, how fast that is growing, or how, the, how this uh, resulted in so much growth. Uh, packages now has over 25,000 PHP packages. So most likely, if you're trying to write some piece of PHP code that solves a sort of generic problem, you might want to look there first, because in 25,000 packages, there's probably someone who's already solved that particular problem that you're working on. Um, and there's over 20 million installations per month of packages on packages. All right, I think I'm running short in time. It's going to unfortunately have to step over this part. Uh, I wanted to, this is really not that much detail. I just kind of wanted to show that um, this, these changes to libraries and this renewed innovation uh, also resulted in the PHP language becoming more active. So there's now actually a regular release cycle. Um, there's regularly new features introduced in PHP. The one thing I'm still going to do just uh, really quick, there's like another two slides and I'm pretty much done, um, is the composer JS you'll find in Drupal 8. So sooner or later, I imagine we'll come across this, and I just want to show this to you and like, briefly explain what this actually means. Um, so it, I, have this, I split this into two parts. Um, the actual dependencies come in the second slide. The first one, um, well, it consists of just some metadata, just like the name of the package, the description of what this is, and licenses that are all pretty self-explanatory. Um, then there's the auto-loading I mentioned before earlier. Um, there's a set of namespaces loaded from particular directories <coughs> within the Drupal core. Um, and there's also a file that's always included, which contains uh, traditional function definitions, which cannot be auto-loaded. Um, and there's a little bit of configuration that makes sure that rather than just installing it to a vendor directory in Drupal, things are installed into the core vendor directory, and then you can use the vendor directory for your custom dependencies. Uh, this is the list of dependencies that Drupal 8 has at the moment, quite a few. Uh, there's a couple of Symfony components, and that's like the interesting thing about Symfony. It's not one of these traditional frameworks where you have to use the whole thing or nothing, but it's actually just a set of components and like a couple of libraries and, uh, or framework libraries on top of that. So that Drupal decided to use some of these, but not all of them. So Drupal isn't technically a Symfony framework application. It just uses some of the libraries that the Symfony framework also uses. Uh, so things like the Symfony Event Dispatcher in the fourth line that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's things like the Symfony routing that takes care of uh, routing URLs to controllers. Uh, most of these, uh, you know, if you look them up in packages, you'll find out what they're all about. But basically, if you just look at the names on the left, you have packages, and you see what this is, read the readme, you find out about them. All right, so this is the last slide that I kind of use for every composer talk. Um, this is something that I like to ask all of you to do. So the next time you're trying to work on a project, First thing you do before you actually start writing any code, look around and see if somebody else has already solved the same problem. And if you cannot either use that solution as it is, or maybe use part of that solution and then write a small library yourself which solves a single purpose, which will then be very useful to other developers who you share this code with. 
So if you all reuse things more often, rather than write things from scratch so frequently, uh, rather than write the same code over and over again, uh, we can develop new, very useful, value creating products much more quickly, much more frequently. And this will help reinvigorate PHP. All right, there's a couple links if you want to find out more. GetComposer.org is the Composer website. Package stuff like I mentioned before. Find stuff on GitHub. All right, thank you, everyone. set up things so that those permissions are given and you will have to use the command line tool. because it, it doesn't have the ability to be rerun easily. So Composer install, you can run 100 times in a row and it'll just, you know, it'll keep working. It'll just decide, hey, there's one thing we have to update now. Oh, that was my timer. That is a whole lot louder than I thought. <laughs> Right, so Composer, yeah, Composer is sort of more flexible than what it does, it's more standardized across different PHP mm -hmm. projects, and it also provides a mechanism to easily update a package, right, to update dependencies, which uh, uh, Rich Mike does not do. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. well, that's it, thank you all again. Uh, we'll be around for a while, if you have any further questions, find me, talk to me. <coughs> thank you.